Welcome to Clayton Valley Presbyterian Church. It's so good to see you this morning. I hope that the worship service is meaningful for you today. Good morning and welcome to Clayton Valley Presbyterian Church on this, the 23rd of August. As you may remember, this is my last day of vacation and uh, you again have an excellent preacher who will be sharing with you this morning. She's a good friend and I'm grateful for her presence here today. Um, I will be back in the office starting tomorrow, but as you know, our Sunday evening prayers will continue tonight as well as next week resuming with Taze. And we will still have our adult study on Thursday and um, our coffee hour today after church. I hope you will join us for all of that. This is the day that our God has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Please join me in the responsive call to worship. With nature in its power and beauty, with rain and wind and sunshine, with the ancient rocks and the budding flower, we gather in praise of God. With believers and seekers the whole world wide, with people in every land and speakers of every language, we gather in praise of God. With Jesus who promised his presence and the spirit who showers her blessings, we gather in praise of God. Here let heaven and earth embrace. Here may God's people find home. to 
Let us say together the responsive prayer confessing our need for God's grace. For the right roads we avoided traveling and the kindly words we refused to share. For the false gods who received our worship and the true selves we have starved of love. God, by your grace, forgive us. For the hidden hurts we have held too lightly and the promises which we never kept. For the careless use of our time and money and the lame excuses we should never have made. God, by your grace, forgive us. For all we should be and all we can amend, God, in your love, renew us. For all you have in store for us and all you may demand of us, God, in your love, prepare us. For the life of the world and the love of its people, God, in your love, commit us. For the celebration of God's grace, hear the words of Jesus, your sins are forgiven, God in peace, come and follow me. Lord is my light 
These are the prayers which we bring forward for this Sunday. From Pastor Barbara, continued prayers for her nephew Kevin, who is still fighting an autoimmune disorder, quite ill, but doing slightly better. God, in your grace, hear our prayers. For Pastor Johanna and her congregation as she continues her chemo treatment. God, in your grace, hear our prayer. For Megan's recovery, God, in your grace, hear our prayer. For Jane's son, John, and for Jane, as she had surgery on the 20th of this month for some blood restoration, some bypass surgery for her leg where she has had multiple surgeries. God, in your grace, hear our prayer. For the increasing pain and poverty throughout all our world, God, in your grace, hear our prayer. For all caregivers, for all essential workers, God, in your grace, hear our prayer. For Ken and Jean's daughter, Susan, who is ill, God, in your grace, hear our prayer. For children missing out on socialization and teachers, God, in your grace, hear our prayer. For all of the de devastation in Beirut, God, in your grace, hear our prayers. For Janice's friend Dee, who continues in her recovery, but yet feeling separation from her family, God, in your grace, Hear our prayers. For Mitchell and Kathy, who are both dealing with ongoing cancer treatments, and for Kathy, who is also under treatment for MS, God, in your grace, hear our prayer. For Nadine's daughter, Tina, who will be having serious cancer surgery on August 27th, God, in your grace, hear our prayer. For Linda's friend, who is very ill son, and her mother who has tested positive for COVID. God, in your grace, hear our prayer. For Josh, Molly, and Kyle, God, in your grace, hear our prayer. For Helen, who has perhaps by now had her foot surgery, we pray, God, in your grace, hear our prayer. For Brad and his continuing battle with ALS, God, in your grace, hear our prayer. Prayers for Susan's daughter, Tricia, God, in your grace, hear our prayer. Prayers for those out of work, for restaurant and grocery store folks, and for people who live alone. God, in your grace, hear our prayer. Amen. The first reading today is from Exodus 1, verse 8 through Exodus 2, verse 10. Now a new king came to power in Egypt who did not know Joseph. 
he said to his people, the Israelite people are now larger in number and stronger than we are. Come on, let us be smart and deal with them. Otherwise, they will only grow in number. And if war breaks out, they will join our enemies, fight against us, and then escape from the land. As a result, the Egyptians put foremen of force, work gangs over the Israelites to harass them with hard work. They had to build storage cities named Pithom and Ramses for Pharaoh. But the more they were oppressed, the more they grew and spread, so much so that the Egyptians started to look at the Israelites with disgust and dread. So the Egyptians enslaved the Israelites. They made their lives miserable with hard labor, making mortar and bricks, doing field work, and by forcing them to do all kinds of cruel work. The king of Egypt spoke to, to two Hebrew midwives named Sifra and Pua. When you are helping the Hebrew women give birth and you see the baby being born, if it's a boy, kill him. But if it's a girl, you can let her live. Now the two midwives respected God, so they didn't obey the Egyptian king's order. Instead, they let the baby boys live. So the king of Egypt called the two midwives and said to them, Why are you doing this? Why are you letting the baby boys live? The two midwives said to Pharaoh, Because Hebrew women aren't like Egyptian women. They're much stronger and give birth before any midwives can get to them. So God treated the midwives well. And the people kept on multiplying and became very strong. And because the midwives respected God, God gave them households of their own. Then Pharaoh gave an order to all his people, throw every baby boy born to the Hebrews into the Nile River, but you can let all the girls live. Now a man from Levi's household married a Levite woman. woman. The woman became pregnant and gave birth to a son. She saw that the baby was healthy and beautiful, and so she hid him for three months. When she couldn't hide him any longer, she took a reed basket and sealed it up with black tar. She put the child in the basket and set the basket among the reeds in the riverbank. The baby's older sister stood watch nearby to see what would happen to him. Hello there. I hope you've had a good week and that this Sunday finds you well. I'm uh, excited to be a part of worship with you again today. Our lesson from today is from the book of Exodus, where we find the Israelites living in Egypt as slaves, building cities for Pharaoh under the watchful eyes and whips of the Hebrew overseers. Moses, an Israelite from the tribe of Levi, has been raised in the Egyptian court as the adopted son of Pharaoh's daughter but has been exiled after murdering a, an Egyptian who was fighting with a Hebrew slave. While in exile, God encounters Moses as the burning bush and calls Moses and his brother Aaron to intercede with Pharaoh to liberate the Israelite slaves. I want to sum up their encounters with Pharaoh to bring us up to today's readings in chapter 12 of Exodus. Moses said to Pharaoh, let my people go into the desert and worship God together. And Pharaoh says, no. Aaron strikes the waters of the Nile and the river and every vessel of water in Egypt is turned to blood. The fish die, the river stinks, and everybody has to dig along the river for fresh water because nothing in the river is drinkable. But Pharaoh isn't impressed because the court magicians can also turn the water red. And so Moses tries again. He says, let my people go into the desert and worship God together or your whole country will be covered in frogs. Pharaoh says, no. And so the people of Egypt are overrun with frogs. They have frogs in their bedrooms and their beds, frogs in their kneading bowls and in, in their ovens, frogs in the rivers and canals and pools, in their homes and in the courts, frogs everywhere. Pharaoh says to Moses, 
Pray for God to take away the frogs for me and my people, and I'll let you go make sacrifices to God. Here Moses, who usually has a lot of trouble speaking, becomes oddly genteel and verbose. He says, Kindly tell me when I am to pray for you and for your officials and for the people that the frogs shall be removed from you and your houses and be left only in the Nile. And then in an unexpected response, Pharaoh delays. Instead of saying right now, Pharaoh says tomorrow. Moses replies tomorrow, as you say, the frogs shall leave you and your houses and your officials and the people and will be left only in the Nile so that you will know that there is no one like God. But the frogs don't disappear. They die right where they are, in the beds and bedrooms and mixing bowls, in the houses and in the courtyards and fields, and they have to be gathered into these huge stinking heaps. But when Pharaoh sees that all the frogs are dead, he hardens his heart, changes his mind, and refuses again to let the Israelites go. This sets the pattern for the other plagues. Moses asks, Pharaoh refuses, Aaron strikes the dust of the ground, and there are gnats covering everything, people, animals, plants, like dust. Then came swarms of flies everywhere, and then a plague on the livestock, horses, donkeys, camel herds, the flocks falling over dead. Then Moses threw ashes into the air, and the people of Egypt were covered in boils, they had sores so bad they couldn't cover them up with, with makeup and come to work at the court. Then rain and thunder, hail and fire came down on the people and the animals, the trees and the crops, and crushed everything. And then the locusts came and ate all the dead plants. Each time, Pharaoh promised to let the Israelites go. And when the plague stopped, hardened his heart and refused. During the ninth and next to the last plague, Moses stretched out his hand and darkness fell over the land for three days. The darkness was so deep and complete that people couldn't see where they were going and travel around. After this, Pharaoh still denied Moses' request to let the people go worship. In fact, he told Moses if he ever saw him again, he would be a dead man. Moses replies that there will be one more plague in which all the firstborn in Egypt will die, after which Pharaoh will beg them to leave, and then Moses leaves Pharaoh full of hot anger, as the text says. We pick up the story in Exodus 12. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron, This month shall mark for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. Tell the whole congregation of Israel that they are to take a lamb for each household, and the whole assembled congregation of Israel shall slaughter their lambs at twilight. They shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and on the lintel of the houses in which they eat it. Let's talk for a minute about the ancient meanings of blood. Blood to the ancient Israelites symbolized the things that today we associate with breath. Blood pumping in the heart meant that someone was alive in the same way that we might check for breath to see if they were still living. Consumption of blood was forbidden because it contained the spirit of life. Israelites were permitted to eat meat, but they, had, but they were required to drain off the life blood, returning it to God. It is this life blood, this carrier and symbol of life, that the Israelites spread on the, the doorpost and lintel of the, of the houses to protect them from the 10th plague, the death of the firstborn. Picking up at verse 8, They shall eat the lamb that same night. This is how you shall eat it, your loins girded, your sandals on your feet, your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it hurriedly. It is the Passover of the Lord. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike down every firstborn in the land of Egypt, both be human beings and animals. The blood shall be a sign on the houses where you live. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the, no plague shall destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. The Israelites went and did just as the Lord had commanded Moses. Well, I had questions about this, about the way they were to eat. Hurriedly, staff in hand, sandals on feet, loins girded? That sounded like my mother telling me to always make sure I had on clean underwear in case something happened to me. 
Um, I thought it might just be me though, so I asked around and, and to a person, everybody I asked, you know, what do you, where do you think your loins are? There would be kind of a blink or a stutter and a version of the eye and, and the question, those are our privates, aren't they? And um, I, I thought they were too, but I couldn't figure out why God would care about the Israelites wearing underwear, so I investigated. I started with pork loin because um, pork loin is the on, only loin I had heard of. And I'll show you a chart here. You can see that uh, on the pork and beef that the loin is a cut of meat from the lower back. So then I wondered, well, is there, is, is that the corresponding place on the human body? You know, would that be the lower back instead of the privates? Um, because we don't have that on our current anatomical charts. But I did a little research and here's a chart from 1923, uh, the beginning of last century. And you can see that at one time, the part that we now call the lumbar region was called the loins. So if you go to the chiropractor and get your lumbar uh, vertebrae adjusted, then you're well familiar with your loins. It is your lower back. Um, so the next thing I did was look up to GERD. I knew about girders in a building. Uh, they're the, the supports underneath the cross beams. Um, but I couldn't figure out how that was related to girding loins. So to gird is to encircle or support with the band, to strengthen or prepare for challenges or duress. Um, it's also the word root for girdle, uh, which is a garment that goes around the lower back. So to gird one's loins meant to, to draw up one's robes and, and gather them around the, the lower back of the body in order to prepare for battle or work. To gird one's loins was to become an early Israelite action figure. I have a picture here. Um, it's a picture of both men and women, a man and a woman with their loins girded, ready for harvest or battle or whatever action is required. So the people were to eat the meal, to eat it quickly, to be ready for the moment, the opportunity to escape when it arrived. Shoes on, robes tied up, staff in hand, ready for whatever action would be required. We're told that the Israelites went and did just as the Lord commanded Moses and Aaron and got themselves and all their things ready. Picking up at 29, at midnight, so that this is from twilight to midnight, they've been ready for hours. At midnight, the Lord struck down all the firstborn in the land of Egypt. From the firstborn of Pharaoh who sat on his throne to the firstborn of the prisoner who was in the dungeon, and all the firstborn of the livestock. Pharaoh arose in the night, he and all his officials and all the Egyptians, and there was a loud cry in Egypt, for there was not a house without someone dead. Then he summoned Moses and Aaron in the night and said, Rise up, go away from my people, both you and the Israelites. Both you and the Israelites, go and worship the Lord as you said. Take your flocks and your herds and be gone and bring a blessing on me too. The Egyptians urged the people to depart in haste, for they said, we shall all be dead. So the people took their dough before it was leavened and their kneading rolls, bowls wrapped in their cloaks on their shoulders. The Israelites had done as Moses had told them. They had asked the Egyptians for jewelry of silver and gold and for clothing. And the Lord had given the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians so that they let them have what they asked. And so they plundered the Egyptians. The time that the Israelites had lived in Egypt was 430 years. At the end of 430 years on that very day, the enemies of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt. Let me first say first of all that I don't think that God killed the Egyptian children and animals as an act of personal vengeance any more than I think that God killed all those people with HIV or that God is killing many people with coronavirus now. That's not the God that I know. I think that God set up a world of cause and effect with natural laws according to which things unfold and according to which things happen based on our interactions with that natural system. There are many conjectures about what might have happened naturally, scientifically, to cause the 10 plagues. Dr. Stephen Mortlock, the pathology manager of the Newfield Health, the Newfield Health Hospital in Surrey, England, 
wrote an excellent paper in 2019 explaining how each of these plagues in the order listed in the Old Testament could have been the result of the fallout from a volcanic eruption. All of which is to say, I don't think God takes personal vengeance on God's creations. God does tell us, however, that God works within all events, bending history toward a good outcome. I think of Jeremiah 29, um, all things will, I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans for good and not for evil, to give you a future with hope. Or Romans 8, 28, all things work together for good to those who love the Lord and are called according to the Lord's purposes. What is clear is that something cataclysmic happened in Egypt on the night of the Passover and that the Spirit of God leveraged these events to liberate a people from slavery. As people in the story engaged with God directly and with each other, God made sure that they were prepared to take advantage of the opportunity and were prepared for liberation when the moment arrived. This is true for Moses and Aaron, but not only them. In her book, Defiant, What the Women of Exodus Teach Us About Freedom, Kelly Nikondeha examines the role of the women and of the Egyptian neighbors in the events of the Exodus. We're accustomed to hearing this story as Moses versus Pharaoh, or the Israelites versus the Egyptians. But the forces of liberation and oppression don't fall so neatly along national or ethnic lines. The forces of, per, of oppression work to perpetuate privilege and power systems that benefit the a few at the expense of the many. On the side of oppression, we have Pharaoh and his advisors and officials, as well as the Hebrew taskmasters and supervisors of the slaves building Pharaoh's cities. For the liberation forces, in addition to Moses and Aaron and Miriam, we have Pharaoh's daughter, her servants, and the Hebrew women who helped raise Moses um, safely to adulthood. We also have the Egyptian neighbors of the Hebrews who were aligned with their Hebrew neighbors in this conflict. They sympathized. They cared for each other across ethnic and national lines. They wished, wished each other well and assisted each other when possible. Let's look at that passage again. The Israelites had done as Moses told them. They asked the Egyptians for jewelry of silver and gold and for clothing, and the Lord had given the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians so that they let them have what they asked, and so they plundered the Egyptians. Well, the narrator of Exodus is quick to call this plunder, but to me this looks a lot like support. This looks like love of one neighbor, one family for another. The author describes allies working together to resist the oppressive forces together in spite of the mandates and violence perpetrated by the leader. After the Israelites have been protected from the 10th plague, the death of the firstborn sons, the first thing God says to them is, remember this night and celebrate it as a perpetual ordinance. God wants them to remember and celebrate this liberation forever. The next thing God says is consecrate to me all of your firstborn, the firstborn among the Israelites, of human beings and of animals, is mine. Since God has already made a covenant with all the descendants of Abraham and Sarah, you will be my people, God says, I will be your God. We might wonder why the firstborn in particular must be consecrated to God separately and specially. The Hebrew word for firstborn, bekor, means first male offspring, the oldest son with the honor, status, prominence, and privileges of inheritance of the firstborn. The firstborn son received twice the inheritance of the other sons, and the daughters wouldn't have received anything. The firstborn son also, at his father's death, would have become the head of the extended family the clan, with all the honor, power, and prestige associated with that position. Perhaps God required that the firstborn be consecrated to ensure that the leaders of the families and the leaders of the nation of Israel would be aligned with the forces of liberation and not with oppression, to teach the compassionate use of privilege to benefit the larger society. The godly imperative to Israel to care for orphans, widows, and immigrants, remembering that they were once slaves in Egypt, occurs seven times in the laws of Moses. 
This imperative applies to all of us with any kind of privilege. It's the work we're called to do as people of God, a God of justice and mercy and freedom. I've been reading a lot on how to be a good ally for my black neighbors and my neighbors of color, my immigrant neighbors, my LGBTQ plus neighbors, and my neighbors with a lack of essential resources. I found a commonality in my readings, three things that we can do to align ourselves with God's liberating forces. The first thing we can do is to identify our own areas of privilege and confront our own internalized prejudices. This means doing our own work. It means talking to those that are out there fighting oppression in our systems. Uh, it means examining our thoughts, our experiences and assumptions, um, our, our approaches to the world that we might not be aware of. It also means to um, research the discounted histories and personal experiences of those who the system doesn't benefit so that we can learn without putting the burden of educating us on those who most need us to be allies and advocates. The information is out there for us to educate ourselves. The second thing we can do, so we're on number two of three, is to be willing to talk about what we learn, especially with people privileged in the ways that we are privileged. Um, we don't need the presence of the oppressed as witnesses of us standing up. We don't need them to be object lessons to remind us to address oppressions in our own circles of influence. A sidebar on privilege, each of us may be privileged in some ways and not in others. For example, um, while I have experienced oppression as a woman and a lesbian, I am privileged in that I am white and a person of resource. So it will be important for me especially to talk to other white people with resources about what I come to understand about oppression. The third thing we can do is we can become allies and action figures, like the early Israelites with their girded loins, on the side of liberation. We can participate politically, by vote and by letter, by email and by protest. If we're not sure how to help without hurting, we can begin by, by giving financial support to people and institutions who are already doing the good work of liberation in our own communities. We can share what we have with generosity and with empathy, with encouragement and support and love, just as the Egyptian neighbors did for the Israelites as they worked toward their liberation. Okay, in our lesson today, we've witnessed the preparation and the plagues and the Passover. What shall we remember? What good words of inspiration and wisdom shall we take away from this salvation story that undergirds our history with God even to this very day? God is with us and for us. God protects us and delivers us. God wants all of God's children to be free and live abundantly. God works through preparation and opportunity to save God's people. Each of us is called to educate and equip ourselves, called to be ready to move when the moment is right, called to be people of action for the body of Christ on earth. As believers in God's plan for abundant life, we are called to be allies and action figures on the side of liberation until all of God's people are free. At this and every moment of salvation, we are called to follow God's lead. God is already out there working in the world. So let us gather whatever provisions we need. Let's pick up our tools and gird our loins and join the work of God in freedom. May God bless you all. Amen.
Offering ourselves in prayer, let us join in the responsive prayer of thanksgiving. All that we have and all that we are are God's gifts to us. In return, we offer back a token of all we have and are, asking that it and all we possess be used to share God's love and grace. Blessed be God. I've got peace like a river, I've got peace like a river, I've got peace like a river in my soul. I've got peace like a river, I've got peace like a river, I've got peace like a river in my soul. I've got joy like a fountain. I've got joy like a fountain in my soul. I've got joy like a fountain. I've got joy like a fountain. I've got joy like a fountain in my soul. I've got love like an ocean. I've got love like an ocean. I've got love. Finally, I say to you, life is short, and we have choices about what to do with the time that is given to us. We have agency. We have power. Bad things happen because of that, but it is a gift to us. So take the gift of your power, your ability to be part of creation, of co-creating. Take it and use it for good. Love one another, see one another, hear one another, care for one another. It's all that easy. It's all that hard. Now go in peace.